All right. Go ahead and grab your Red Songbooks. Folks are coming in. Appreciate you coming tonight. Red Songbooks, we're going to do 565 there, Miss Barber. That's the, that's the pay. I said, what page you plan? Because I don't know. I'm not paying attention. I'm just playing something. All right. We're just going to. Now, I, I usually don't like doing first or last, a first man or last. I like to do them all, but there's like 5,000 verses to this thing. And uh, so we're just going to do the first and last. I pray God forgives me for that. How you doing, Mikey? Let's stand together if you want to, if you're up to it. 565 on the first now. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. All right, you can be seated. Appreciate y'all coming tonight. We've got a few things to, to uh, cover before we get into the service tonight. And... Uh, Brother Doug gets 50 demerits, but his mom's got 100 in her account from uh, the 100 credits, so he gets off scot-free, as long as she's willing to share her credits with her son. So, uh, you know, I've had that happen, same thing. I thought I had a coat here, and he didn't, and I've done that same thing before. Okay, come. Welcome to Constitution Alive, the Citizen's Guide to America's Founding Documents. We are here in one of the most amazing libraries on the planet with one of the foremost experts on the Founding Fathers and our Founding Documents, David Barton. David, thank you so much for having us here. Hey, good to be here, Rick. Thanks for having me, bro. So why do you dive into so much history? Why spend so much time in the past? You know, the reason we do that is because we have been the most successful nation in the history of the world to this point. And there's a reason for that. You can't change the formula and expect to get the same results, whether it's Coke or Pepsi or anything else. And so it's important to know the formula, and that's what the history does. There's actually a great quote from a guy named George Mason. Uh, there's 55 guys who actually helped write the Constitution. 39 of them signed that document. Mason did not sign the document. He was there. He was very active, very strong part. He actually went home after the Constitution dissatisfied with some things, and he stirred up some things across America that really produced the Bill of Rights. And so that's why we called him the father of Bill of Rights. He thought the Constitution did not go far enough in protecting individual liberties. But, but he influenced so, both. Well, he, so he, he was real involved both. in the Constitution and involved. then later in, in getting he's, the Bill of Rights. He was very involved in, in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And significantly, he owns another notable title and that if you go back to when we signed the Declaration of Independence, we think of that's when we separated from Great Britain. Not so. Virginia actually separated from Great Britain before they signed the Declaration. And so George Mason is the guy who is a chief author of the 1776 Virginia Constitution where they separated. Now, that, that Virginia Constitution, that 1776 doc, really cool document here. Jefferson used a lot of the language that Mason had used in that 1776 Constitution, later used it in the Declaration of Independence. So Mason has a big influence. But he made a statement that is so profound, they included it in that Virginia Constitution, and they've still preserved it to this day, and it's a great statement. Here's what he said. He says, no free government nor the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. 
And the emphasis there is you keep going back to fundamental principles. Now, you're a baseball guy, and that's why you do spring training every year. Right. You know, you're know, you going back to those basic skills basic, yeah. that you learned. I was a basketball kid. coach. We do basketball camps every year. I've had the kids for a number of years. You keep going back to the fundamentals. Back. Cause you so know, this is the training camp. This then. is the I training mean, camp. This, this is, history that's in this, this room, is it. we're going back to those we're fundamental principles. And, and our objective with what we want to do, our objective is really well stated by John Jay. And John Jay became the original Chief Justice U.S. Supreme Court, but at the time they wrote the Constitution, he and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton did the Federalist Papers, and that was to explain to America what the Constitution is all about. So he's really one of the three guys most responsible for the adoption of the Constitution through those Federalist Papers. But as a constitutional guy himself, who helped write the best commentary on it there is, the Federalist Papers, yeah. he had a great statement on why we study this type of stuff. And, and this is the statement he made. He said, every member of the state ought diligently to read and to study the constitution of his country and teach the rising generation to be free. Now, it's interesting. He relates being free to knowing the constitution. You ought, to, you ought to know the constitution and teach the next generation if you intend to be free. He says, by knowing their rights, they will sooner perceive when they're violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. Now, that's really the objective of what we're doing in all these next lessons that yeah. come along. And there's six verbs that he has in there that will be really the guideline for what every citizen needs to shoot for. So the six verbs... So this will really drive everything we do for the rest of the everything. course, then. This, this is our outline. That's the outline. Okay. He says, first, you want to read the Constitution of country. You want to read and study it. And it's one thing to read. It's another thing to study it. Yeah. So read is like a quick perusal, but study is get to know it. And then he says, and then you want to be able to teach it. You want to be able to take the next generation and say, hey, guys, here's what you need to know. Here's the document you need to know. Here's the principles. This is what will keep you free. And this is the formula that's produced American success. Then he says, when you do that, then you'll know your rights, and when you know your rights, you'll perceive when they're being violated, and then you'll be prepared to defend and to assert them. And there's a big difference between defend and assert. Defend is on defense. I'll defend my rights. Assert them as I'm going on offense to make sure I defend your rights. Which we need to do more of. And that, that's what yeah. we need. You know, too many people say so that's not constitutional. You need to go assert what is constitutional. We have a good friend that's in the military. He's gone through the National War College in, in, there in Washington, D.C., and that's where they train the, the best and brightest military guys on not just how to conduct war, Wars, but how to win wars. Yeah. And there's a famous course they do, the Nine Principles of War. And in the Nine Principles of War, he points out that defense is not one of the Nine Principles of War. Yeah, offense is. Offense. He says defense is, uh, is considered a temporary condition whereby you reorganize to go back on offense. Yeah. You don't win wars being on defense, you're going to be on offense. And so in this culture war, this, this war for the, the future of our country, you've got to be on offense. You, you can't just defend your rights, you have to assert those rights. Well, well now, you, if this is the formula, if that's what's going to keep us free, this part is where we're really losing out, teaching the rising that's generation right. to be free. If, if we don't have a good education system, if we're not teaching what's in this room, we're losing the formula. Well, you hit the education system, let's just be real blunt. We spend up to $120,000 over the educational course of a kid to go to school for, for 12 years. We're not getting our money's worth. Yeah, that's in some of our less expensive districts. Well, that's right. That, that's the average nationally. Yeah. So it's going to be up or down in some. Washington, D.C. is way more than that. Yeah. So it depends on the district you're in. But what we know is that every state constitution says that the purpose of public education is to prepare active and informed citizens. So we started those education systems to do exactly what to John Jay is saying here. Yeah. But what we know right now is if you look at recent elections, those who have gone through our public education system, you're looking right now at 70 percent that do not know the constitution is the supreme law of the land. Wow. So, so it, we're it, definitely failing we're on failing. teaching the rising generation. You're looking at 65% that cannot even tell you what the role of the judiciary is. That's one of the three branches. As a matter of fact, speaking of one of the three branches, 62% of those who have gone through public education cannot even name the three branches of government. More than half. And More they can't. So you definitely don't know what those branches are supposed to do if you don't even know and what they the way, are. Yeah. By the 48% of elected officials cannot name the three branches of government. That's half of our actual public half servants in people. office. If you don't know the three yeah. branches, you don't know checks and balances, you don't know functions, you don't know what the Constitution And that's why you read and study the Constitution. You teach it the rising generation. Well, maybe they devalue what what is in here because they think look this is old stuff i mean i hear yeah. that all the time ah, it's 200 years old doesn't apply today why should i pay attention to, to all this stuff that yeah. happened 200 years well, ago and, and let me just one more time hit this because this is our objective and we're going to look yeah. at old stuff so number one read the constitution two study the constitution three teach the constitution especially the rising generation but maybe to the burger flippers beside you maybe the mechanics in the shop where you work not only maybe the next generation your generation now, because we're at a point now where public education is not taught us so we got to yeah. just teach the constitution Constitution. But once we do that, we want to know our constitutional rights, we want to defend our constitutional rights, and assert our constitutional rights. Now, 
that's what we're after. But you've raised the issue up. You know, it's a really old document, and we hear that because yeah. you know the founding fathers when, when when they did this Constitution, they didn't have internet. I mean, fastest transportation, no airplanes, they had horses. Yeah. You know, so what can we? It, it, I've been involved in a number of, of court cases, state and federal courts, on issues of history, original intent. And one of those issues is the issue of the Ten Commandments. Because for generations in America, you're more likely to find a copy of the Ten Commandments hanging in a civic building than in a religious building. Right. And that's just the way it was. I mean, the, the Ten Commandments are considered the foundation of law. And so in so many of these places where the Ten Commandments has been hanging, there's now a lawsuit saying, oh, you can't do that. That's religious. You have to take that down. So in going through and, and telling the judge, no, here's, here's the first law book in America. It goes back to the Code of 1650, and it quotes the Ten Commandments th all the way through. Y you go through and show the, how it influenced, well, these judges wanting to be a lot more open-minded, if you will, so open-minded their brains fall out, but nonetheless, some of the comments they make is, well, you know, it would be constitutional if you were to include other legal documents that influenced America as well, not just Ten Commandments. And, and so many of them said, for example, include the Code of Hammurabi. Now, because that influenced well, see, that's the, that's America. I mean, where do they even get that? The Code of Hammurabi is 300 years older than the Ten Commandments. Now, the Code of Hammurabi, according to these judges, that's a document that influenced American law, influenced the creation of our legal system. Therefore, you ought to show it along with Ten Commandments. The Code of Hammurabi, you know, real problem with these guys, because they've just proven they don't have a clue what they're talking about, is it was not discovered until 1904. I don't think that quite made the founding fathers. Unless they had a time machine, came just, forward, checked yeah. it out, and went back. That's kind of. But yeah. see, here's here, and you're talking about the, the the Constitution written 200 years ago and how old it is. The difference is the Code of Hammurabi. It's got 282 laws. That was what governed Babylonian civilization. This was 300 years before Moses got the Ten Commandments from God on on Mount Sinai. So let me just show you some of the laws out of that code, and let's just see how they work today. Let me, let me go to number two law in the Code of Hammurabi. Right. If anyone bring an accusation against a man, and the accused go to the river and leap in the river, if he sink in the river, his accuser shall take possession of his house. Now. I'm not quite sure the context of that. Hey, you can't go swimming to so find out who's... If, uh, if I charge you that you've done something, you have to go to the river. And if it turns out you can't swim when you jump in and you sink, then I must have been right because... And it continues. It says, and you get the house. Yeah, I get the house. Yeah. But if the river proved that the accused is not guilty, that is, if you can swim and you escape unhurt, then he who had brought the accusation shall be put to death. So I, I'm the you one... You better hope gets, I don't swim. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You better not swim. Well, he who leaped in the river shall take possession of the house that had belonged to his accuser. Now, can we really fit that into our... Can we show I don't that think that that's going to work today, I don't, yeah. I don't recall any occasion with any American law where we had you go jump in the river. See, the problem with the Code of Hammurabi is it is so specific you cannot apply today. Yeah. Now, you take the Ten Commandments and look at the Ten Commandments. You know, I think that thing about honoring father and mother still works. I think thou shall not kill right. still works. There's not, there's not one of those now, that doesn't work today. Every one of those still works today. And the, the reason is they're not drawn on specifics, they're drawn on principles. They take timeless principles because the nature of man doesn't change and we still kill. You said you learned. Now, the reason you need to be updated on some of this stuff, I sent this to Auto Impact and some of the other folks the other day. This is how the Lord's at work. Is I'm going through the audio book of The Devil and Karl Marx. I would not recommend it for ladies to read. It is, is vile, right? but it's Karl Marx, and he's vile. But to see how it affects, as already affecting us, I took a break from reading it for about three weeks. Then last week, I get an article or a, a screenshot from a page of the Ottawa County Health Department's website about infants, I want to be appropriate now, sexual stimulation, stimulation and teaching three-year-olds do the same thing. I'm not going to be so specific as it was in the headline on the MI Ottawa County Health Department website. Three years old. Infant. Vile. Damnable stuff. Then, three days ago or so, I started listening to the audiobook again because things have slowed down a little bit. I can get back doing that, so I'm driving to work. Section 5 I think it's chapter 15 at the 1436 mark or something, 1346 mark. A guy named Reich from the 1920s, a vile sexual pervert. His book was so vile, Congress banned it 
in America. In that article, by Rice, almost word for word, what came was on the Ottawa County Health Department website. That tells you that Marxism is firmly entrenched in our county. Now, if we're not steady and we don't know that, we're going to be taken over by that wickedness, that vileness, that sexual revolution. And remember that Marx, produced, he created, he called for an economic, a class warfare. But you can't do that with a middle class, right? And America had a middle class. So that failed in the 1950s. So then they changed to a sexual revolution and then race warfare. And that's where we're at now. And of course now, now the kids are picking out one of 100. I thought it was 52. It's up to 100 different genders that you get to, be, get to choose for yourself. Just heresy, damnable heresy. But if we don't study and we're not alert to it, we'll fall prey to it. But that's enough of my rant. You ready, old coatless one? All right. <laughs> Come on. Appreciate you. Sure love this guy, man. I love you, too. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. If you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter number 2. Romans chapter number 2. And uh, it'll be just a little bit before we come to that. <clears throat> But Romans chapter number 2, I might preach better tonight without a code, I don't, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, thank you, Brom, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer a minute. Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to study your word together. And thank you so much um, for the privilege it is to be a part of a church that stands for truth, even when it's not popular. And uh, Lord, I ask that you would protect our church, and I ask that you would use us and that our voice would go out and reach those who are struggling and, and need to hear the truth. And I ask that you would strengthen us um, in what your word teaches. And uh, so please bless our time tonight, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the sermon tonight can in, in many ways be summarized by the statement that you see up on the screen there. This is from Dr. Jeffrey Satinover. He was a Jewish uh, medical doctor. His book, I mentioned it to you a couple of weeks ago, Homosexuality and the Politics of Truth. And he said, the great modern solution to guilt is, will you finish it with me the next three words? Define it away. Homosexuality is not a problem, gay activism proclaims. The problem is the defining of homosexuality as a problem. Now, before we get into this, let me just remind you of the theme that we're working under for these three Wednesday nights. The theme is sodomite agenda normalization. And as I explained a couple of weeks ago, it seems that, the, that their agenda can be summarized in that one word, normalization. So under this theme, we're looking at three uh, different issues. The rejection of science, revision of terms, and then uh, the reversal of sodomy. So a couple of weeks ago on June 8, we considered that first issue, the rejection of science. So tonight we'll be considering that second issue. And what I hope to demonstrate tonight is that the sodomite agenda uh, revises terminology in an effort to normalize the behavior of sodomy. And again, I believe the whole goal behind the sodomite agenda, behind Gay Pride Month, is to normalize this behavior. And as pastors emphasized, emphasized repeatedly, we are not against the people, we're against the behavior, against the practice, the lifestyle, because the Bible is against that behavior. And we're not mad at anybody. We just want people to know what the Bible says. We want people to know the truth. So with that being said, here is the plan for tonight. Just two points. Number one, the revision of terms under this. Uh, we're going to look at how advocates of homosexuality have revised terminology to try to normalize the homosexual lifestyle. And that may not seem like something the Bible speaks about, but any time you revise terminology to normalize a sinful behavior, that is a deeply 
theological and spiritual issue. And I hope to show you that tonight. And then secondly, why does it, why does it matter? And so under that point, when we get to that, we'll consider why the revision of terminology is so important to those seeking to normalize uh, homosexuality and why it is indeed a deeply theological and spiritual issue. Okay, so let's get right into this. Number one, revision of terms. Um, under this point, I'm going to just, I'm going to take you th through a lot of historical facts. I, unfortunately, I'm going to do a lot of reading. I have a lot of quotes that I'm going to put up here. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's very important to understand the history and a lot of the revision that has gone on to try and normalize this lifestyle. So first of all, we need to take a step back and get the big picture of what's happened in our culture. Pastor just mentioned a moment ago, the sexual revolution happened in the late 1960s. And Dr. Satinover gave a great insight of that in just a few sentences. I'll put it up here. He said, The medical community understood that as the influence of the 1960s counterculture had lifted all constraint on human sexuality, not just the homosexual variety, so too had it lifted the constraints on every imaginable form of sexually related illness. Think about that for a moment. Because of the sexual revolution, diseases began to spread. Syphilis, which was basically eradicated one generation before, had become an epidemic among teens. Gonorrhea related pelvic inflammatory disease and herpes, which can cause blindness and death to children born of actively infected mothers. So this is part of the result of the sexual revolution. This is part of the consequences. It reminds me of Romans 1.18 where we're told that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And that's exactly what I think this is. Uh, Dr. Satinover goes on later to add, in 1981, as GRID, stands for Gay Related Immune Disorder, began to spread, the condition began proving itself inevitably fatal. One thing seemed obvious. Medical sanity would soon have to prevail over our clearly catastrophic two decades long experiment in sexual liberation. You see, our, our culture as a whole began to rebel against biblical morality, specifically in the area of sex. And what we see is the wrath of God is being poured out as a result. Diseases suddenly spring up. The disease that was prevalent among homosexuals was called GRID by those in the medical field. Again, GRID stands for Gay-Related Immune Disorder. But Dr. Satinover explains in his book that those who were pro-homosexual immediately began working to revise the name of this disease. He writes... The first move in the early 80s was to eliminate the earlier name of the condition. Because under the right circumstances, the virus was transmissible to anyone, pressure was swiftly generated to rename uh, the gay-related immune disorder to AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Though the connection to homosexuality is universally understood to be valid, and the medical literature still speaks of homosexuality as the major risk factor for AIDS, the fact that gay male intercourse and promiscuity uh, created the American Reservoir for HIV, the pathogen that causes AIDS, and continues to preserve it, quickly became an unspeakable truth. Think about that. An unspeakable truth. Not allowed to say this. Not allowed to talk about this. So when this disease began to spring up as a result of homosexual activity, the homosexual community immediately worked to revise the terminology. As one man said, and I've, I've shared with you, I've shared this quote with you before, and it, I think about it all the time, all culture change begins with language change. Will you say that with me? All culture change begins with language change. Remember, their goal is to normalize the lifestyle, is to normalize this behavior. So in order to do that, they must conceal the fact that the immune disorder is disproportionately higher among homosexuals because, it, because homosexuality creates the problem. 
So it's not GRID, it's AIDS. After this revision of GRID to AIDS, the pro-homosexual community began working to revise the American Psychiatric Association's list of psychiatric illnesses. Listen to how quickly this happened. In 1963, the New York Academy of Medicine charged its Committee on Public Health to report on the subject of homosexuality, prompted by concern that homosexual behavior seemed to be increasing. The committee reported that homosexuality is indeed an illness. The homosexual is an emotionally disturbed individual who has not acquired the normal capacity to develop satisfying heterosexual desires. It also noted that some homosexuals have gone beyond the plane of defensiveness and now argue that deviancy is a desirable, noble, preferable way of life. Okay, so question. I, I didn't put that up there, but so did this committee view homosexual behavior as normal? No, 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 absolutely not. Okay, just 10 years later, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association voted to strike homosexuality from the officially approved list of psychiatric illnesses. How did this occur? Normally, a scientific consensus is reached over the course of many years, resulting from the accumulated weight of many properly designed studies. That makes sense. But in the case of homosexuality, scientific research has only now just begun, years after the question was decided. And that's because they were, put, they were putting so much pressure on this association. In fact, they were, they were using disturbance and disorder as a... Uh, strategy to try to pressure them to make this decision. Um, so years after the question was decided, and these are the people who claim to be following the science. So that was, that was written, by the way, in 1996. That decision was made in 1973, and the, re the scientific research had only begun in 1996 or somewhere around there. So 19 years after. An article was written by two men from Columbia University named William Bine and Bruce Parsons. The title is Human, Sexuality, Human Sexual Orientation, The Biological Theories Reappraised. In the article, the authors review all kinds of studies and research and books and chapters of books, and they end up coming to a conclusion that was unfavorable to those who are pro-homosexual. Their conclusion was this. This was their conclusion. That homosexuality is changeable. Significantly changeable, in fact. That was their conclusion. Okay, so, so it, wasn't, it wasn't about how, whether or not this behavior was normal. It was, all they, all they concluded was the, homos, the person in, uh, with homosexual desires living in that lifestyle can change. But those who are pro-homosexual want people to believe that someone who practices homosexual behavior cannot change, even if they want to change. So these two authors were attacked, and listen to how one of them responded. This was in the Washington Post. He said, I'm told my criticism is not politically correct. What they're saying, therefore, is that I should subjugate scientific rigor to political expediency. Again, what, what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that part of the sodomite agenda is to revise terminology in an effort to normalize the homosexual lifestyle. If they have to reject scientific rigor, so be it. They certainly don't want you to know that, but so be it. So they fought to revise the name GRID to AIDS, and they fought to get the APA to revise its list of psychiatric illnesses by removing homosexuality from that list, and they were successful in both of these moves. Again, their goal in this is to normalize the homosexual lifestyle. Now, why does all of this matter? <clears throat> why is the revision of GRID to AIDS and the APA's list of psychiatric illnesses, why is that so important, number one, to the homosexual agenda, but second, why is this a theological and a spiritual issue, okay? I've already answered the first question several times, and I'm going to continue to repeat it, <laughs> because I think it's vital to understand this. 
pro-homosexual groups, LGBTQ, seek to revise terminology in an effort to normalize homosexuality. Say that word with say that word normalize with me. Normalize. That's the goal. They want to normalize this lifestyle. Is it going to be hard to normalize a behavior that causes life-threatening immune deficiency? A behavior that gives its participants purple splotches on their body? I would think so, right? So they changed the name from gay-related immune deficiency to acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Is it going to be hard to normalize a behavior that is viewed as a psychiatric illness? <laughs> Absolutely. So they pressure the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from its list of psychiatric illnesses. They're fighting to normalize their lifestyle. This is why revision is so important to the homosexual agenda. But why is this a theological and spiritual issue? What, what does revising GRID to AIDS have to do with God? Why is the removal of homosexuality from the APA's list of psychiatric illnesses a spiritual issue? Here's why. When a person or a group of people or an organization is trying to normalize a sinful lifestyle, there is something that always stands in the way. What is it? The conscience. The conscience. And this is why I believe the revision of terms, and it's not just with the sodomite agenda, it's all across our culture today. This is why it is a deeply theological and spiritual issue. Again, I remind you of the quote that I shared with you at the beginning. The great modern solution to guilt is define it away. Define it away. Revise the terminology. Usually when you hear the word guilt, you know we're talking about something having to do with the human conscience. When someone is trying to normalize a behavior that most of society believes is sinful because they have a conscience, you have to convince people that it isn't sinful. You see, because their conscience stands in the way of normalizing that behavior. Does that make sense? Homosexuality doesn't cause these terrible diseases. It doesn't shorten people's lives by up to three decades. Those diseases are caused by something else. It's called AIDS. Homosexuality isn't a mental illness. See, the APA said so. Homosexuality isn't a choice. Some people are just born that way. They can't help it. And even if they want to, that's the way they were born. They need to just embrace it. But they won't be able to unless the society approves of their behavior. Do you see how this works? So under this point, I want to consider what the Bible has to tell us about the conscience. And we won't consider everything the Bible has to tell us about the conscience because it says a lot. Just some relevant truths for what we're looking at tonight. So you should be in Romans chapter number 2. And we are going to, uh, we're going to read this passage. And then we're going to work to define and sort of flesh out the conscience. All right, Romans chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 12. If you're with me, say amen. amen. All right, Paul writes, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. In verses 6 to 11, we didn't read those verses of course, but in those verses, Paul made the point that God's judgment is impartial. He has no respect of persons. There is no favoritism. And then in this section, he moves to talk about judgment day. In verse number 12, he explains that those who have sinned without knowing the law will perish without the law. Perish there, I believe, refers to being eternally condemned to hell. Um, it's the same word that John uses in John 3.16. 
In other words, they will not be judged according to what they did not know. And by contrast, the Jew who had the law will be judged by the law. In verse 13, Paul tells us that the doers of the law are justified and not hearers. Okay, But according to Romans 3, 19 and 20, which since it's right, it should be right across the page, let's just read that a moment. Paul says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, according to Romans 3, 19 and 20, no one will ever be justified by doing the works of the law. Nobody. It's never going to happen. Um, so he, he continues... In verse 14 and 15, and this is where, where I really want to get to. I'm just kind of going through this fast. But let me read these verses again. Back in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, he says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In other words... When people who are ignorant of God's law do the things contained in the law by instinct, by nature, they are a law unto themselves. They show that the law of God is actually written in their hearts. While they have never read, thou shalt not murder, they know instinctively that it is morally wrong to murder. As one man put it, the law which God had revealed to Moses fundamentally expressed an innate sense of right and wrong that the Creator had already inscribed on all human hearts. What was the first murder in Scripture? Cain and Abel. Cain murdered Abel long before Moses ever penned the Ten Commandments. So was Cain innocent because he didn't have the written law of God? No, of course not. Before the law of God was written, there was and still is natural law. Humans instinctively knew right from wrong, and, they, and we still do today. Paul says at the end of verse 14 that these become a law unto themselves. So the standards they develop, which are based on the law of God written in their heart, will end up being the standards by which they themselves are judged on judgment day. For the person who was ignorant of the written law of God, Paul says in verse 15, their conscience will be a witness against them on judgment day. Apparently, the conscience is clear enough to be used as evidence on judgment day. Everything Paul is describing is what will happen, as he says in verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The secrets of men clearly refers back to verse 15 where Paul was just talking about the conscience. That's the secret. Nobody else sees your conscience. Nobody else knows the guilt that you feel. It's all internal. It's a secret. But one day that conscience is a wit it will be a witness against you. It will provide evidence against you. Okay, so now that we've just briefly analyzed the passage, I want to consider what it has to teach us about the conscience, okay? First of all, the conscience is an inner witness. Will you say that with me? The conscience is an inner witness. We see this in verse 15 where Paul says that the conscience also bearing witness. And this makes perfect sense because the Greek word translated conscience, it's right there for you, sunidesis, means, it literally means co-knowledge. You see, your conscience knows your inner motives and thoughts. You can't hide your motives from yourself. <laughs> this is so important because your conscience is what convinces you that you are sinful. You are sinful and you deserve punishment for your sin. Your conscience does that. It can, and, and that you need a Savior. You're not good enough to get into heaven by your works. No one is. 
For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Your conscience is what convinces you of that. Your conscience knows everything that you do. It knows the bad thoughts that you linger on. It knows the places where you went where you shouldn't have. It knows all the things that you've done. It, it, all of that. Okay, so the conscience is an inner witness. Secondly, the conscience is a judge. Will you say that with me? The conscience is a judge. Paul says that our thoughts, um, there in verse 15, he says that our thoughts accuse us or excuse us. They say guilty or innocent. Our thoughts do that. You see, your conscience is a moral judge. But what's so interesting is that we even care so much about what our conscience says. Think about this. There are people who have committed suicide because of a guilty conscience. There are people who can't sleep at night because of a guilty conscience conscience. But when you think about it, why should you care what your conscience says about you? Think about this. If you heard that a judge accused of a crime had decided to hear his own case, you would laugh, right? First he sits on the bench, reads the charges, then jumps down, goes down to the witness stand to defend himself, then jumps back up to the bench to pronounce himself not guilty. It'd be a joke, right? And yet you judge yourself every day, and it doesn't feel like a joke, right? It's deadly serious. Why is that? How is it that your own judgment is so powerful? This seems mysterious, but when you read what Paul has to say in Romans 1 and in Romans 2, it begins to make sense. Two passages I want to show you quickly. Look at Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 19. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 19. He says, because that which may be known of God is, what's the next word? Manifest. Where is it manifest? In them. For God hath, what's the next word? Showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are, what are the next two words? Clearly seen. Being, what's the next word? Understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, what are the next two words? Without excuse. Did you know the emphasis? Manifest, showed, clearly seen, understood, which means they are without excuse. Now, we already read the second passage, but look at it with me again, please, in chapter 2 now. And then I'm going to make a connection here. Romans chapter number 2 and verses 14 to 16. He says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, all of those thoughts, that conscience, by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Clearly, I think it's clear, the conscience will play a significant role on Judgment Day. It will be used as evidence against us. And the point is this. Even though we all feel like what's going on in our conscience is secret, we also have an intuitive sense that the Creator knows our secrets and will hold us accountable. Every person knows that. Every person born into the world has that innate sense, and that is why the conscience is so powerful. When you do something wrong and you feel that guilt come on you, it's not just because you're judging yourself. It's because every person intuitively knows that there's a creator who knows that also. It's not a secret. Nobody, no other human may know, but he also knows. That's why the conscience is so powerful and needs to be taken seriously. So the conscience is an inner witness. The conscience is a judge. 
The third thing I want to show you is that the conscience can be distorted. Will you say that with me? The conscience can be distorted. Okay, to see this, uh, please turn with me to another passage, 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Should be to your right there, just a little ways. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. And once you found that, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. First Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, here we go. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So we see in this passage that your conscience can be distorted in two ways, both of which are bad, obviously. <laughs> we'll start in verse number three, and then we'll work our way back through uh, verses one and two. So first of all, the conscience can be distorted by becoming oversensitive. Will you say that with me? oversensitive, forbidding marriage and commanding to abstain from meats. Are those things wrong? Of course not. So if your conscience is bothering you about those things, then it is oversensitive. It's wrong. It's been distorted. The fact that people can have an oversensitive conscience um, caused problems for the church in Rome. It caused problems for the church in Corinth, and it still causes problems in churches today. This is why it's so important that the Scripture is our authority, not our opinion about right and wrong. So we see that the first distortion is that the conscience can become oversensitive. The second, this passage also shows us that the conscience can become distorted in that it becomes insensitive. Will you say that with me? Insensitive. So you've got oversensitive, you've got insensitive. This is what Paul's talking about in verse number two, where the false teachers are his subject. These are people who at one time were in the faith, but they departed because of demonic seduction. And they began speaking lies and they were hypocritical. How could they lie and act hypocritically? Paul says it's because they seared their conscience with a hot iron. In other words, they disabled their conscience from bothering them. They made it insensitive. The first time you tell a lie, your conscience puts a heavy burden of guilt on you, doesn't it? Or I shouldn't say the first time. <laughs> you probably don't even remember that. But let's say, let's say it's been a long time since you've lied. Let's say it's been like two hours ago or something like that. <laughs> Hopefully it's been a lot longer than that. But, uh, and, then, and then you tell a lie. And if your conscience is working correctly, right away it should, be, it should produce guilt you should feel terrible for lying. But if you ignore it and you just keep on lying, eventually it stops bothering you. The sensitivity is gone. And you can lie all the time. And you, you don't even realize it. It doesn't even bother you. But here's a question for you. According to verses 1 and 2 here in 1 Timothy 4, what was, what was it exactly that seared their conscience. Look at those two verses. Just read them a minute to yourself. What do you think it was? What, what was it exactly that seared their conscience? Departed from the faith? Following the deceiving spirits? Yeah, I think, I think you could say seduction. It was seduction. They gave heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So here's, here's the truth that I think we can extract from these verses, okay? Right here. Seduction disables the conscience from working properly. Will you say that with me? Seduction disables the conscience from working properly. If it's working properly, that means it's making you feel guilty when you should feel guilty. When you do something sinful, you should feel guilty. But if you've been seduced in some way, 
it disables it. It's not going to work. The faith, on the other hand, keeps the conscience working like it should. Because notice, they departed from the faith, but why did they do that? Because they were giving heed to seducing spirits. There was seduction that took place, and they departed from the faith, the conscience was seared. Now, how, how does all of this relate to the sodomite agenda and their revision of terminology? If you're going to normalize a sinful behavior, a behavior that every human being innately knows is morally wrong, you first have to seduce people so that their conscience stops saying that's wrong. Does that make sense? So this is why the revision of terms is a deeply theological and spiritual issue that is not to be taken lightly. But I also want to add that the medical community and the American Psychiatric Association do not determine morality. <laughs> Though pro-homosexual groups can revise terminology all they want. They can distort their own conscience and seduce other people, but they will never be able to make homosexual, homosexuality morally right. They may normalize it in the culture of the United States. I sure hope they don't. But it will still be a sin against God, and it will always be a sin against God, and he will always judge it. His wrath will always be revealed against it. It doesn't matter what terms you redefine. It doesn't matter... If you say it's not an illness, people are poor. It, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Of course, we should still fight for what's true, though, out of love for other people, especially and in, in just because it's the truth. Okay, the fourth and final truth about the conscience that I want to point out tonight is this. The conscience is a gift from God. Will you say that with me? The conscience is a gift from God. Isn't it amazing that God has put this internal barrier in every single human being <laughs> to keep a society from descending into moral corruption and then tyranny. Isn't that amazing? He's put that in every single person. And it's, this, it's an interior barrier that protects us, protects us individually, protects our family, and ultimately protects our society if it's working correctly in, a, in, a, in most people. What a gracious gift from a loving God who really does not want to pour out wrath. He wants to save people and bless people and give people a good life. Um, We've got to define what a good life is, but <laughs> I think you all know what I mean. <clears throat> so if churches continue to be seduced or worse, silent, then this barrier will soon be torn down. And I think that's what's ultimately happening in churches all across our nation, is this interior bar barrier called conscience that every person has, it's being slowly dismantled so that people, th their conscience does not bother them. They, they see a homosexual couple and they don't cringe. It's just, it's just a normal part, it's normal. Some people are just like that. And that barrier will soon be torn down and our culture will dive headlong into moral chaos and debauchery. So I want to challenge you. Don't be silent. Don't be silent. Speak out graciously and lovingly, but speak out. And I mean at your work with your family members, just speak, speak the truth. And let me say this. The only way to keep from being seduced and having your conscience become insensitive to the sin of homosexuality or any sin is to stay in the faith. Stay in the book. Stay in the local church with a, with a fellowship of believers around you. Stay in that, because if you don't, you will be conformed, like we looked at a couple of weeks ago, you'll be conformed to this world, and your conscience will stop functioning the way it's supposed to function. Okay, so next week, Lord willing, we will consider the third and final part of this, the reversal of sodomy. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, and I just... Thank you that it is a reliable 
guide that tells us what's true. And uh, Lord, I just thank you so much for that. God, I ask that you would give us great boldness and graciousness and kindness. God, that we would speak the truth to people and, and to those we love and to friends and neighbors. And um, God, please give us the boldness to do that. And we love you. Please have mercy on our country. And uh, God, I just, we beg you that you would turn things around. We don't want to see this happen to our nation. But God, we know you're, you are no respecter of persons. And uh, you judge sin, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And we know you will. And so God, we ask that you would have mercy. And um, please use us to help turn things around in our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. See, that's the problem. See, you got to be careful who you hire. Because, you know, either way, it's job security. Like Biden, you never have to worry about him being assassinated. Right? Because of who's next in line. Yeah. So that's what I am. But him, but the opposite. They get rid of me, they get that. So they're like, we better keep the ignorant old guy, man, and... No, no, that happened, man. Thoughts. If I say Orwellian, what does that mean? George Orwell. Mm -hmm. George Orwell's most famous treatise, 1984. Right? In that 1984, the desire was to destroy the family. What does homosexuality do? Because they can't reproduce, therefore they have to recruit. That's when they, now they're bringing out drag queens and our own attorney general says every school, every school needs a drag queen to read to the little children. Why the little children? Because they're influenced, right? But if we don't step up and say something, and we don't start fighting back, they're going to get them, all right? Um, in Orwell's 1984, they had the Ministry of Love, which was dedicated to what? Anybody remember? Yeah, somebody said opposite. Hate. Yeah, Ministry of Hate. But the ministry of love was given to hate. The ministry of peace was given to war. Uh, again, the ministry of truth was given to lies. So they reworded, they redefined those words. Orwellian, this guy was like a prophet. But he really wasn't a prophet because he'd already seen it in communism that existed in that day. Whether it be uh, uh, Stalin's uh, Russia or Mussolini's Italy, they'd already seen it in action. And that's what they did, right? Then we talked about uh, the importance of, of uh, speaking out. But I just heard twice in the last week, the highest number of unbelievers in the history of the United States. Right? Now, there's a reason for that. It's because mom and dads are too busy making money and not indoctrinating their kids in the Word of God. So we gave them to the public school system. They trashed them. Even in the medical career field with Dr. Danny, I was going to ask, if, if a young person comes in saying, these are my pronouns, do you have to use those? Okay, there is, it is a press coming to the medical career field that you will have to do that. I just watched a doctor talking about that, that you will be required to use their pronouns. All right? You saw the Navy's promotional video. Have you seen that? Wonderful, wonderful. Two sodomites showing how to properly address people. Hi, my name is some, my pronouns are he, him. Hulk's not on that. You don't play that silliness. You, you just go on with normalcy. Okay, here's my, here's my, here's my last thought provoking question. All right, is sodomy a sin? Okay, now, it's going to be here in just a second. All right, so you got that one. You did good so far. Conscience is working. All right. Are people free to practice sodomy if they choose to do so? Is child molestation a sin? Because that's on the board now. Because they should be able to have sex with whoever they want, regardless of age. And the children desire it because at three years old, even as an infant, they have sexual desires. And they're desiring that. 
And so the adults are helping them satisfy those desires. So it's, it would have to get so much better to be bad. You know? And uh, so that's going to be another thought. So why is that wrong? And why can't I have two wives or four wives? Or well, why can't I do that? Who says? Who made you? Who died and left you? What's that? Yeah, well, that's another problem. And I'm not, there's a whole other whole other argument there, Trudy, that we won't go down. <laughs> because I got to go home with her. Amen. <laughs> Love you. It, uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the genus. If you don't have a moral base, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? You know, so you have to have a moral base. If you don't, anything goes. What were the final four sins that destroyed a nation? Anybody remember them? One of them was? Adultery, abortion, homosexuality, bestiality. Right, one verse after another, 20, 21, 22, 23 of Leviticus 18, Sunday night's message. All right, the four sins of that. All righty, that's why we're training. That's why we're learning the word of God so we can take a compassionate, consecrated stand for God. And we're not giving up. It's non-negotiable. Remember that Sunday morning? Thing about God's position on sin, it's non-negotiable. You can try to justify it all you want, but it ain't going to happen. And, all right. So that's it. Not mad at anybody. Just don't try to poison me. Don't try to burn down a place. Just come and talk. If you can defend your position, come and defend it. I'm good. Here's the moral base for our culture. Defend. You go in here and defend it. Well, the sin of sodomy was not homosexuality. It was inhospitality. Because they said, give us these men that we may know them. All they wanted to do was have a barbecue. That's, that's what they say. I'm not making that up. That's, what's, that's their indoctrination of that. By, by the way, it's great to have brother and sister Ingram. They were with us, man, right after they got off the ark. And, uh, and so it's been a long time ago. It may have been this building. But it was, they've been on the field 17 years, or started 17 years ago, and they were with us. I remember Sister Ingrid, because she's the only person I've ever met whose initials are I.I. I just thought that was cool. Ingrid Ingram. I thought she's the only one probably in the world that's got that. Who knows? Your grandma probably got it. But, uh, all right, but what a blessing. They've been in Brazil for how many years now? 15 years. They've been in Brazil in 15 years, just started another church. Uh, and near the Sao Paulo State, about four hours, they said, from Sao Paulo Capital. And, uh, but what a blessing they are. And, and it is so great to just see. They can walk into my office, and I'm like, man, what are you guys doing here? It's been forever since we've seen them. Then my next question was, what was my next question? You remember? Yeah, did I book you? <laughs> that happens now, Art. You're retired. That happens. So, all right, when Kim's saying art, you say, I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> it works. I've been using it, been practicing. Amen. All right. Usually don't know uh, Art and Kim. That's Doug's mom and stepdad. And Art was very instrumental in this building. <laughs> I can't really, but he must have thought of me. But I'm looking at piecing all these doors together. He says, Pastor, you're not going to like piecing those doors together. He says, why don't you let me help you? Now I'm thinking, well, we're going to put in our own HVAC system. Why don't you let me call some guys that I know? He was a builder. <laughs> he built charter schools and grocery stores and things. And let me help you with that. And then they showed up with the first air conditioning unit, the one in the back. Art, I don't know if you know this, but the day it arrived, I had four guys to lift it. <laughs> exactly to lift it off the truck and a truck pull I was over in this corner of the building and that truck pulls in I'm like what's he doing here I go up to the truck driver I said what's that he said that's your air conditioning unit you gotta be kidding me I ain't putting that in the window anywhere so then I ran down to Menards it was just being built got their sky tracks brought it back and lifted it off and said, I had, I'm told when you talk about ignorant a building that was me but it was laid in my lap Tim Somebody's got to do the job. So I figured out my way through it. Lost years off my life. I look pretty good for 27, though, I'm thinking. All right, let's stand together. Sure love you guys. Is it Lois? Is that right? Lois and Joyce. So if I meet you again, do I rejoice? Okay, uh, just a thought. I was just 
And then, then Lois, you obviously are married to Clark. I got that. Uh, all right, no. <laughs> well, see, the problem is that ever since Superman died, I lost my twin. And all right, <laughs> steady, steady. And all right, you guys are awesome, man. Are hey, you gonna take that stuff home, Cade? Yeah, get it. Let me know how it tastes. Yeah, you do, man. You put enough sugar in it, you can drink anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, Anna Spencer may like it too. She might ask her, "You want that coffee pot, baby?" What's that? He's Army strong. He ain't Army strong. He was a Marine, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're all dogging him, man. That's only because his fiance's not here yet. When she gets here, we all straighten up. Fly right, man. Father, I love you. I sure love these people. Love this church. And Father, I think of our teen church going on and all the workers back there and think of our, our kids choir next door and, and all the and great number of kids in there and, and the work the Martins are doing and our nursery workers on the other side of the building. Lord, you've been so gracious to us. And I just want to say thank you for it. And Lord, I want to take a proper stand. I don't want to be prideful about it. I don't want to be arrogant about it. But Father, I certainly want to be passionate about it, convicted about it, and ever, ever, ever studying and knowing more and more of your will regarding our culture, that we might maybe be the salt and the light that would chase away the wickedness and preserve the good and stop the infection. And so, Lord, I love you. Thank you again for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're just